talk about the feet of Christ, in Christ Jesus, our freedom. And one of the things we talk about our freedom that we have in Christ, you know, for, for us to truly appreciate it, understand it, you know, I think we need to understand the bondage we had before Christ. And we just, oh, I, I, I was a sinner. We say that. But do we understand what it meant that we were sinners? That we were chained literally to sin. We had a death sentence upon our life. Every single person is born with that. You don't have to do anything. Just the very nature that is handed down from man to man is sinful. And we are bound. And Satan has a contract out on our life. And in the end, if Jesus Christ does not set us free, if we don't give our lives to him, accept him as our Lord and Savior, you know, our lives go to Satan. We're going to talk about that and get an appreciation of that a little bit today. We're going to step out of the book of James. Um, I'm actually going to ask you to turn to Romans chapter 7, if you would. Romans chapter 7, and I'm going to have you stand together. We're going to read the first six verses of Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law uh, concerning her husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren... You also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died by which to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Maybe see that. Now, if you read these verses uh, by themselves, it, it really is quite confusing. You know, it's talking about law, and it's talking about marriage, and mentioned divorce, and dying, and, 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 and a new way of serving. Well, what is this all about? What's God's points here? Well, in a nutshell, it's, a, it's an explanation of our captivity to sin and speaking about our only hope of being free. And he does this in a very unique way to try to get us to understand. It's not just, he said, well, I know that. You know, I know I'm a sinner and, you know, Jesus Christ sets me free, he forgives and I give my life to him. I, I know that. But he wants us to understand the depth that that our situation was in. I mean, we were walking around with it, literally, literally a death sentence upon our life. And so he gives this illustration to help us to understand that. Let me read the first three verses again. It says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he is living. <laughs> But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, and that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. And we need to understand a little bit about Orthodox and conservative Jews. Uh, they live under a totally different uh, divorce law uh, than we do here in America. Under their law, a divorce, when a married couple you know, is together and they want to get a divorce, uh, under their law, a divorce is only valid when a husband and a wife would appear before a council called the Beth Din. It's made of three rabbis that would be formed together to hear the husband and wife and then hear their grievances. The husband must give his wife something that's called the get, and that's a religious divorce. And not only must he give it, but the woman must accept the get. Now, without the religious divorce, the wife may not marry or date another man. She can, you know, she can't remarry. Neither can the husband remarry. Matter of fact, the Orthodox Rabbinical Council of America, 
which is headquarters in New York City, handles about 500 divorces a year. And it has several hundred unfinished cases where the husband refuses to give the get, you know, the releasing the woman. These Jewish women whose husbands will not release them, they are called aganas, or literally they're called chained women. Because of the law of the marriage, they are still chained, they are still bound to their husband by the law of marriage. Now it's this illustration that God, that Paul draws upon to illustrate our bondage to sin. Listen, that every single man and woman is born into. There is a bondage, literally as I said earlier, we are, we are chained to sin. It's been handed down to us through birth. And we may not like that relationship, but we have no real power to get away from it. We may say, I don't want to sin. I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to do that. But you have no power. We are chained. We can't do a single thing about it. Just as there is a law that binds the Jew in marriage, he's saying there is a law that binds us to sin. Verse 5, it said, For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit to death. That's what our life was. Our life was consumed in sin. Matter of fact, if you turn back just a chapter or two in chapter 5, verse 20, the first part of the verse, I'll just read it for you. It says, The law came in so that transgressions would increase. Okay, it's talking about the increase in. Let, let's talk about that for a second. The law of God. It's not saying there that the law of God created sin. God's law simply defined it. You know, sin was still there until God, you know, gave the boundaries and said, "This is sin." You do this is sin. He gave it words. He gave it. it, it he gave it titles, and you know, it was already there in place. Matter of fact, it says the law entered. When the law entered, it didn't create sin. It entered in to help us define, to understand our sin, understand right and wrong before God. Laws of God are defining points between God and man. They make us aware of our separation from God. That's why the law was there, so we would understand when I do this, you know, this is a sin against God. And it's important for me to understand that it's not just, oh, it's my choice, it's my freedom. But it's, under, it's important to understand what our actions do in our relationship from God. So the law literally kind of sped up the, this whole process. It sped up our awareness uh, of, of our sinfulness. The law of God does nothing to eliminate sin. I mean, you can all testify to that. I can testify to that just because I know something is right or wrong, doesn't mean I do it. You know, knowing what the speed limit is doesn't mean you necessarily necessary stay below it. You know, you're supposed to, and we should. You know, knowing something is wrong doesn't mean we, we obey it. We are being swept down, literally, it says, because of the passions that are aroused in us, because we are chained to our sin, we are, we are being swept downstream of sin. And in fact, the law, just knowing what is right and wrong, it might stop us from doing certain things, but it's only a dam that literally backs up the water. You know, can you imagine the pressure that's, you know, pushing on the, the, the Hoover Dam? And that's the pressure that we constantly have pushing on us because of our sin. And unless the sin, unless the water is removed, you know, eventually it's going to swell over the dam. Well, there are many things in our lives that we know the difference between right and wrong. But knowing what is right and wrong, you know, doesn't do a lot to de deter our actions. I mean, we, we do battle with our thought life constantly. You know, I know I shouldn't be lusting after that person. You know, I know I shouldn't be harboring that bitterness towards that person. Or I shouldn't hate that person. I know that's wrong. God says it. I know I shouldn't be jealous and, and covetous of what other people have in their lives. And, and we know these things, and the law reveals that it, it identifies that these things are wrong for us. And we can try to beat these things back in our life. We can try to control them. But, but, but that sin is just like a magnet. Because we're chained to sin. It is constantly pulling us. I know pride is wrong. I know selfishness is wrong. And yet, there's that constant pull to be self-absorbed. To be proud and haughty and to, 
to exalt, our, re, exalt ourselves. And regardless of our desire to sever that relationship, say, I don't like what sin is doing into my life. Literally, we are bound, we are chained to it. And there are only two ways that we can be free. And that's where this illustration comes in. Number one is that sin would release its claim on us. Literally give us the get. You know, that, that sin would divorce our, my relationship with us. Well, folks, that's not going to happen. Satan, we may request it. We may not want to sin. But Satan is never going to release us. Never going to release us from that draw, that, that, that captivity that he has us in. There's a second way that we can be released from sin, and, and that's death. Our death releases, that's what it talks about. The husband dies, and you know, then the, the woman is free. But folks, when we die, then it's too late. You know, we have to pay for our sins. You know, it said in the previous chapter, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Once we get to that point, then we're paying for our sins. And that's where we enter the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and Paul has, God has built up this, the, we're supposed to have this great understanding of how desperate our situation is. So that when suddenly Jesus Christ enters in, we understand that he went to the cross as a perfect payment for our sin. He died for our sins. He died so that through identification with his death, literally his death, becomes our death that sets me free from sin, breaks the bond of sin in my life, the chains, that they be broken. Verse 4 says, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that you might bear fruit for God. That's why that death is so important of Christ's death on the cross. He died as a substitute. He died. Satan isn't going to release you from the cost of sin, the bondage of sin. But literally, when we become a Christian, when you accept him as your Lord and Savior, Christ's death becomes your death. And through death, we are released from sin. Well, it's hard for us, you know, to any of us to relinquish control. It's hard for anybody here to admit that we cannot somehow do it on our own. That I can somehow control my sin. That somehow I can't, you know, earn my way to heaven. It's hard for us to admit that literally we are powerless. In fact, I was thinking through you know, biblical history, and it is just filled with man's attempts to say, I can do this, I can take care of this problem on my own. I mean, it started way back in the Garden of Eden. I mean, God created man in this perfect communion with him, this perfect environment. And yet when Satan tempted them to eat the fruit, remember what he said? He said, if you eat the fruit, your eyes will be open. You will be like God. In that sense, what Satan was saying is, here's something that you can do. You can control. And so man took the fruit. In the wilderness, remember when God had freed Israel from Egyptian bondage, and they're in the wilderness. Remember, they cried out to God. They said, God, just tell us what to do, and we will do it. And so God put the ball in their court. He gave them the law that defined sin, defined what to do and what not to do. But they couldn't do it. Then they cried out for prophets. You know, give us a messenger from God that will speak to you, to, you know, to us directly. And God gave them prophets, but they killed the prophets. Later they would cry out for a king. Give us a king. Like We want to be like all the other nations. You know, have a king go out before us and fight our battles. But the kings turned away from God. And finally, man's independent nature came to a climax. And they took Christ to the cross and they crucified him. And remember what they said when, when Pilate was, was sentencing Christ to be crucified? You know, Pilate's washing his hands of it. Remember what the people said? They said, his blood be upon us and upon our children. We'll take responsibility. We can handle it. You know, we can do it on our own. All this, all this God has allowed, all these examples of our inability 
know, to, to reconcile ourselves to God. He's allowed all of these things so that we might humble ourselves before him and desperately cry, God, I can't. God, I need you. Have you come to that point in your life to understand and to see that you can't on your own and our desperate need that we have for Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins, to give us a new life, to be a Christian, it's not about the doing the things. I'm going to start going to church, or I'm going to serve, or I'm going to give, or I'm going to you know, go work at this mission. It's not about the doing. It's about coming to the place to say, I can't do it anymore. I'm giving my life to you, Christ. I'm going to let you do it. You lived the perfect life. You went to the cross. You died for my sins. I am. I'm going to give up my own efforts. And I'm going to accept you. Christ steps forward. He steps to the cross. He dies for our sin. He breaks the chains. He gives us the opportunity to break the chains of our bondage to sin. Then three days later, he rises victorious over death. He defeats sin and death. And now he says, all who cry to God for help, he says, accept me, exchange your life for my life. To be crucified with Christ, literally it says in Galatians. Yet, you know, I live, yet not I, but, but for Christ to live in me. Give up your efforts. It's about Jesus Christ. Folks, have you done that? <clears throat> have you come to that place, to the end of yourself, to say, I can't, and I want God to forgive my sin. I want Jesus, I accept him as a payment. That's that first step that God, God wants nothing else out of you except that step to save you, to make you a child of his. That's all God wants. That Right now, if you're not a Christian, that's the only thing that God wants of you. I mean, it's great that you're here. It's, 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 it's great that you might do something, but that, you know, those are as filthy rags before God literally. It says all of our righteousness outside of Christ. He wants one decision for you, and that is to give your life back to Him. To exchange your life for His life. You know, at the end of the service, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray with you. And if you'd like to accept Christ today, this is a chance for you to accept Christ. Right now, you can do that. We pray about that. But, but I want to apply this a little bit more because I know many people here are saved and are Christians. Um, you know, this message is, is not only for unbelievers. As a matter of fact, he starts in verse 1. You know, it's interesting what he says there. He says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law. He wasn't speaking to, you know, spiritual, ignorant people, people who knew. These people, you know, many were saved and many were already Christians. This is the message he wanted them to hear, to understand as well. So it has an application for, for unbelievers, for someone to come to Christ. It's a plea for them to come to him. But it also speaks to me as a Christian, as a believer, and hopefully for you. You know, we still have that nature of sin that wants to control us. You know, we still have that same draw. You know, it, it, sin has no legal claim upon us anymore, but it does not, does still have that draw. But sometimes as Christians, you know, we feel that we can live the Christian life on my own. But when we try, we either fail miserably or, or either become legalistic in a relationship. You know, you know, things like grace and mercy and forgiveness, those things kind of take backseat to the doing it, my power, my strength, my goodness. Well, God has gone to great lengths to illustrate our inability and our need for Him so that we might make this application. He says in verse 6, He says, But now we have been released from the law, having died to that which we are bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. You see, our relationship with God, becoming a Christian, is based on what Jesus Christ has done. It's not based on what we have done. And then our life still needs to be lived dependent on Him. 
not on our own efforts. It's not, hey, thanks Christ for getting me here. You know, thanks for getting me into the kingdom. Thanks for making me a child of yours. I got it from here. You know, I've been a pastor for 30 some years. I got it, God. I got this all figured out. You know, I've got the experience. I've been through the, you know, the hoops. You know, I've been a Christian for, you know, 10 years, 15 years. And, you know, I've learned. And, and now I, I've got this, Lord. You see, our nature still wants to live in the realm of external relationships where we do, God, I can do. God, just tell me what to do, and I will do it. You know, push all the right buttons. Push them at the right time, and you come up with the finished product. I mean, if I just do, you know, I, I hope I'll have peace and hope and unity with God and, 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 and love. You know, I hope that will be produced. And so it's easy, even as for Christians... It's easy for our Christian life to become about doing church. I do ministry. You know, I do our jobs. And when we do that, and you know, so often we feel we feel empty. You know, where's this fulfillment? Where is this, this joy that God is talking about? You know, I, I notice one thing about the statement in verse 6 that he makes. You know, the goal has never changed. Just the way we go about meeting the goal. Let me read verse 6 again and think about this. It says, But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we are bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. That goal of, of serving God, that doesn't change. But just how we go about it. Now it's not my effort. It's not about what I do in serving God. It's about what I allow God to do in me. It's about my connection to the Holy Spirit. It's about allowing Him to work His power in me. It's not about my strength. It's not about my experience. It's not about my ability. It's all about me allowing God access in my life and allowing God to work in my life. Now that sounds very religious. But what does it really mean? What does it look like, you know, to, to serve God not by my own strength, and my you know experience and power, but to serve in the, the, the power of the Spirit? What does that mean? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> well, let's say you have a conflict with your neighbor. You have a conflict with a fellow worker. You know, someone you go to work every day and you know you become angry with them, and every time you see him, your blood pressure just raises. You know what's wrong. You know sin is wrong. You know anger is wrong. You know you're supposed to forgive. You try to control it. You know, you just came from church Sunday. And you know, it's all fresh in you. And you go to work and you try to do your very, very best. But you keep slipping back into it. You know, slipping back into your old patterns of sin. But what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what we used to do. We used to just try harder. You know, I'll, I'll dig in a little bit deeper. You know, pull up my bootstraps and, and hunker down and and, and conquer this. God doesn't want that. God wants you to take your sin. And if you're a Christian today, God wants you to take your sin and give up. And let Christ change you. Call upon Him. What does this entail? <coughs> well, right, first, ask for forgiveness for you, your heart and your attitude. You know, second, ask the Lord to change you inside. Lord, don't just change what I do. Really change my heart towards this person, this individual. God, you know, your Holy Spirit is living within me. God, change me from the inside. And then finally, obey what he tells you to do. What he tells you to do in his word. I mean, God tells us to, you know, you know to heap, you know, do good unto our enemies, you know, and heaping coals upon just the goodness and upon goodness upon that person. You know, that even upon our enemies. That's not on God to do. I can't do that. But God, He can do that within me. He can change me. So you're a Sunday school teacher. Well, how do you serve? How do you teach Sunday school? How do you go about to serve? How do you go about being a trustee or a deacon or you know on the worship team or you know, sound booth or PowerPoint, whatever it might be? What do you do? You know, how, how, how do you do the Bible study? Do you just you know like learn my lesson? 
I use my experience. You know, I've been through so many Bible studies before. I know what works and doesn't work. You know, I put in my proper time for the Bible study, and 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 hey, if I do this, you know, the results are going to come out. Or do you just do all those things? But then I rely on the Holy Spirit. I'm going to study God's Word. Certainly, it's an important to your experience, and you know, you know how to put these things up. But in the end. That isn't what's going to matter. In the end, what is going to matter is are we relying on the Holy Spirit to move me, to guide my thoughts and guide my heart as I preach or as I teach? Are we asking for continual guidance to Him in our, from Him in our services? Or have we come to the place to say, God, I got this. I've done this long enough. Do you want a marriage? That is honoring to Christ. Well, you can go it alone. You can do like the world and just try as hard as you can in your efforts. Matter of fact, I had one couple. This is uh, not here. I think it was in Illinois. I was sitting down with a couple and we were going over the marriage vows, you know, and the commitments, you know, and to, to honor and to cherish till death do us part and, and everything. And, 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 and they were uncomfortable with that. They said, and I'll never forget this one looked at me and say, can't we just say we're going to do the best we can? And that's what so many of us want in our relationship. God, I'm just going to do the best I can, you know, and hope it's enough. None of our best is enough. That's the point. The point is we need Jesus Christ. I need him in my marriage. I need him in my ministry. I need him in my workplace. To give my life to him. To allow him to work through me. And not to rely upon ourselves. We come to Christ based on what He has done. The only way we're saved is through His death, through His resurrection, through His forgiveness. And we live for Christ still based on the same way. And it's so easy as a Christian to forgive, forget that. It's still based on His ability to conquer death, to conquer sin in our lives, to give us the power to move us so that we might bear fruit for Him. So as we close, let me ask you, who, who is living your life today? I mean, you know, the, the, the illustration we always go to is, who's driving that car? You know, you, you, you've seen the bumper sticker, if God is your co-pilot, then it's time to change seats. God needs to be driving it. God is the power. God is the strength. He says to take inventory of your life. If you're, if you're not a Christian here, this is about getting saved. This is about giving your life to Christ. This is about having your sins forgiven. If you're a Christian, this is about joy. This is about the power of God in your life to live. And did you accept Christ then to, to just move on with the rest of your life in your power and strength? It's an exchange life, my life, for Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask if you, if you would just bow your heads with me for a minute. I said earlier, I was going to pray for anyone who would like to, at this moment, if you understand that you want to give your life to Christ, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. And I'm going to pray for those of us who know me as well. Just pray with me in your heart. Father, I ask you right now to forgive me my sins. You know what they are. Father, I, I understand that it's not about me trying to do better. It's not my, about me trying to please you. Father, it's about me giving up my efforts and accepting your son, Jesus, his death on the cross, his resurrection, his victory, his freedom from sin, Lord, to become mine. And Father, I ask you to, to come into my heart and to forgive me. I want to be a child of yours. And Father, as a Christian, I, I want to understand more and more Lord, what it means to abandon my own effort. Forgive me, Father, for the times that I've taken control, that I haven't taken the time to, to get my mind and my heart right with you, you know, to make sure my service and the things that I am doing are in your power and in your strength and producing your results then, Father, for your kingdom. Forgive me, Lord. Open my eyes, Father, my marriage, open my eyes, at work and in my neighborhoods, at school, to those around.
around me, Father, and how not I can reach them, but I can just be that vessel that you work through to do your, your work for your kingdom. And I will thank you in thy son's name. You know, we're going to sing a, a wonderful closing hymn, very familiar to us. It's number 596. Very familiar to us. We're going to sing an a cappella. When you get to number 586, it's I Surrender All. I'm going to ask you to stand together with me. And this is what this has all been about, a surrendered life. You know, surrender our life to Christ for salvation to become saved. Surrendering our life every single day. I am crucified with Christ. Daily I take up my cross. And I followed him. We're going to sing that first and we're going to sing that last verse. Let's sing it together. <clears throat> All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence.